Welcome, and this is the first part of these mini lectures about brain protection and support. Protection of the brain is obviously crucial to the survival and well-being of the organism. The functioning of the nervous system requires an exquisite, delicate chemical environment to operate optimally. And we'll talk about ways the brain controls the chemical environment in the next lectures. Right here, we're going to be talking about the physical protection of the brain by the skull and the meninges. The brain, not having any of that fibrous connective tissue which gives strength, is a soft gelatinous blob, the consistency of soft tofu. So let's get back to that skull that you learned about a long, long time ago and in a place far, far away. Those flat cranial bones that you learned about are sutured together to form the brain's protective shell. And because its superior aspect is curved, the skull has this self-bracing architecture. And this allows for the bones to be thin. And like an eggshell, the cranium is remarkably strong for its weight, allowing for protection against blunt trauma. That said, the brain is surrounded by cerebral spinal fluid and the brain is essentially floating in the skull. A strong enough force impacting the skull can cause the brain to move in the skull, slamming the brain into the cranium and injuring the neural tissue. And so the spinal cord is also encased in bone. It leaves the skull at the foramen magnum and enters the vertebral foramen. There it floats inside that fluid-filled cavity of the vertebral column. And that's all I'm really going to say about the skull and the vertebral column and that bony protection. Between the brain and the skull are additional protective connective tissue layers that act as packing material and close and protect blood vessels and also form the space that will contain the cerebral spinal fluid that surrounds and floats the brain. These layers are called the meninges. So you might be familiar with the term meningitis. This refers to inflammation and swelling of these meninges layers due to some kind of infection. Because these layers are wrapped tightly around the brain, the swelling can press against the brain and cause local dysfunction, even if the brain tissue itself is not infected. And so the spinal cord is also wrapped in these meninges layers. And these spinal meninges have the same names and organization as the cranial meninges, but the spinal cord is a simpler structure. So I'm going to go over that spinal meninges first. And this here is a really nice little illustration. You could see with the spinal cord in yellow, with the nerves coming off the side, and then those meninges layers in blue and pink are wrapped around the spinal cord or opened up to show them a little better. So let's look at those individual layers of the spinal meninges in this cross section of a spinal cord inside the vertebral column. Starting with the deepest of the meninges layers, the only layer in direct contact with the neural tissue, we have the thin and delicate Pia mater. Superficial to the pia mater is the layer called the arachnoid mater. And importantly, in between the arachnoid membrane and the pia membrane is the subarachnoid space. And this is the space that is filled with cerebral spinal fluid in which the brain floats. We'll be talking more about the cerebral spinal fluid a little later. And most superficial is that strong, fibrous, connective tissue layer called the dura mater. The dura mater attaches to the adipose tissue in the epidural spaces, unlike in the brain where the dura mater will be directly attached to the bone. So that's it for the spinal meninges. And the cranial meninges is going to follow that same pattern as in the spinal cord, although we will see some additionally named structures involved in compartmentalizing parts of the brain. So again, directly connected to the surface of the brain and following all the crevices of the brain is the delicate pia mater. The arachnoid mater is superficial to that. And again, in between the pia mater and the arachnoid mater is the subarachnoid space, which contains the cerebral spinal fluid surrounding the brain. And so the dura mater here is actually a double membrane in the brain and in some locations opens up to create a space called the dural sinuses. Both the dural sinuses and the subarachnoid space will come up again when we talk about cerebral spinal fluid flow. So those are the protective membranes between the brain and the skull, covering and protecting the brain and enclosing and protecting blood vessels that supply the brain, as well as creating spaces that will be containing cerebral spinal fluid. 
And so when looking at some of the brain images like this, the pia mater is so thin that it is not distinctly visible. The arachnoid mater appears like a webby sort of appearance, as you could see on the right side of this brain. The dura mater, on the other hand, is a very distinct, very tough and tangible layer. And lastly, the dura mater also divides large regions of the brain. The falx cerebri separates the left and right cerebral hemispheres, whereas the falx cerebelli separates the left and right cerebellum hemispheres. In between the cerebrum and the cerebellum, there's also the dura mater infolding called the tentorium cerebellar. That's it. We'll see you next time for the cerebral spinal fluid.